Hi everyone, Larry here, and we are going to go into our book of Acts today. We're going to continue in chapter 16, covering the second portion of that chapter. Last time we did verses 1 through 21, and this time we're going to take up where we left off in verse 22 through the end of the chapter, which is verse 40. So by all means, if you are in a position that you can grab your Bible or your tablet or whatever you use to read the Word of God and open it up to Acts 16 and follow along, we'll take it and open up the Scriptures. And I've already prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to guide us through this as we can learn from God's Word and, of course, then put it into practice. Well, just to update you, today is uh, Saturday. It is the Saturday after Thanksgiving. It is uh, the 27th of November, 2021, the year of our Lord. We're right here in Midtown Sacramento. It is a nice fall day. Crystal clear out a little chilly for California in the mid 50s or so. I guess it's around 60. Well, anyway, I have a new pair of glasses on, so we'll see how that goes. It might get some reflection in there. I'm trying to add some light. I need to improve on the lighting, but we'll just make do. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our text. And as our custom is, I'll go ahead and read the text. And then I'll do my little comments on it. So picking up the story in verse 22. And I suppose, it just in a way of review briefly, remember the first part of Acts 16. They come into this uh, area of, uh, well, first they pick up Timothy. And Luke joins them. They get Timothy. They take Timothy along. They circumcise Timothy because his father was Greek, probably to let him get along with the Jews better. There wouldn't be any question. They end up going to uh, Macedonia. They're prevented from going into certain areas by the Holy Spirit. Then God gives them a vision. And Paul sees in the vision a man saying, come over here to Macedonia and help us. So they take off and they end up in Philippi, the uh, foremost colony of Macedonia. And they met a woman named Lydia at the riverside during prayer. And then they were going uh, to prayer. They stayed at her house and they were going to prayer and they met up with a demon-possessed gal who Paul uh, delivered through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, delivered her of those demons, that demon of divination. And because of that, the prophet of the fortune teller was gone. So their slave owners uh, lost money, basically, at that. She had no more power. The demon was gone. It was evident that the demon had enough knowledge that they were able to gain money by doing this uh, practice of, of fortune telling. And when Paul delivered her of the demon, that, that ability was gone. They were no longer to make money. They were very upset over this, and they were motivated motivated by their anger over this and the greed, of course, to go to the magistrates, to the authorities, and complain. And uh, that's what they did. They said that they were teaching customs that Romans were not supposed to obey. And so that was their angle. Well, we're going to pick it up here, and let's read in verse 22. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. 
Wow, that's quite a portion there, quite a great miracle that God uh, did there. And so we're going to take a, a little closer look. Uh, and starting in verse 29, I wrote down, uh, or in verse 39, it's 39 lashes I wrote down. Verse, uh, looks like, um, 23 there in the beginning of that portion of scripture if we remember the the jews had a law and i think you go back to the book of deuteronomy and in the book of the law it was written that if you were going to whip somebody or or beat them with stripes that they were only allowed 40 uh, no more than that and so they would always say 40 minus one which would be 39 lashes. And the reason they did that is in case they lost count, they didn't want to go over. So they would always do one less than the 40 just in case. So they want to go over the law. Uh, to be beaten with 39 stripes uh, would be plenty. Uh, I would think be beaten with five or six would be enough. How about one? <laughs> oh, my friends, that would be very painful. Well, we know Jesus was beaten uh, beyond recognition. We can see from the uh, scriptures, but we got to remember too, he was beaten in a different way. He was beaten not by the Jews. Well, initially he was beaten in the beginnings of the trials there in the Sanhedrin, but he was not beaten with uh, um, uh, the lashes. He was, you know, struck with fists and stuff like that, but he was not, uh, you know, whipped. We see his whipping, his scourging came from the Romans, and they use what we call a cat of nine tails. And that had pieces of bone and different things in there to, to, to make the flesh, you know, split open. It was very brutal. There was no limit on what the Romans could do. So they pretty much beat Jesus within an inch of his life. And In fact, many people died from the Romans flogging. And so that was something to be considered. Now, it says they were beaten with rods. I did a little research. I didn't do a lot of research on this. So I'm not an expert on this, but it, it, what I could find was they were hard wood, like birch, uh, and this would have been beaten over the back or the legs. Sometimes they were beaten on the bottom of the feet. Now, because it says in the text there that they, they stripped their clothes off of them, I'm assuming they were beaten on the back and uh, in that more traditional sense their feet they wouldn't have been able to walk it doesn't mention anything like that also it says that they had uh, just the way they were in the prison it just seems like it would be more they were beaten on you know traditionally in the back or the back of the legs the buttocks area and that sort of thing well i got a picture here i want to bring up um let's look at this and this is a modern uh caning um there's caning going on in the world over in Singapore. There's modern caning. Uh, several years ago, there was a big controversial case where an American was over there and he, he painted some graffiti and the penalty was caning and, and they were saying, no, don't let him go through that. And I think he ended up having to receive that punishment. But as you can see in this picture, it's a, a piece of wood. It's very flexible. Uh, sometimes I think of, of a rod, I think of a metal rod. When it talks about beating your child in the Bible, it sounds brutal when it says to use a rod. We would think of it maybe as in a southern flavor of the U.S., a switch, which would basically be like a, a, a tree branch. So it isn't as brutal as it sounds. It's, it's beginning to be whacked with a tree branch. I think the point in Proverbs, uh, of course, this is going down a little bit of a rabbit trail here with, with a disciplining children is that the idea of using a rod on a child is that you're not using your physical body. You're not using your uh, hand. The hand is, you know, to be used in the outstretch of love. You don't want to spank the kid with your hand, but to, to use a rod, to use something, uh, not to be brutalizing them, but to, to make it painful. But like a, a, if you could think of a tree switch, what we call a switch it's just a branch not as thick as this rod here in the picture that's being shown but it's a it's nevertheless an instrument 
And of course, you're, you're not going to leave, you know, bruising or open wounds by, I mean, that would be abuse. You just want it to sting. You want them to get the message. And I think people make too much of it because for the non-Christian, that does sound pretty uh, inhumane when it talks about the Proverbs and how you should, you know, whack the kid when they're, it says beat the hell out of them, basically beat the, you know, if the kid's been on hell, then beat that, beat him out of him. So, but that is God's word. But in this case, they they were beaten, and so let's uh, let's reduce this back down. And then it says uh, they were uh, told by the the magistrates to throw them in the prison, and they commanded the jailer to keep them securely. And and he have received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison, and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, an inner prison in any prison would be some area that was more secure than others. You go down to the county jail, the local jail, or a prison in your state, if you live in the United States, you're going to find that there are different segments of the prison that are more secure than others. Sometimes it's called solitary confinement. Sometimes it could be just where they keep more notorious prisoners, maybe someone that's already escaped in a prison before. They're going to put him in a more secure area and that's what this guy did he put him not only just in the prison or the jail there but he put him in the innermost part of it now it says he put their feet in stocks well this would you know even more so they're, they're not going to get away you know <laughs> they're behind some sort of you know either bars or a cement wall they're locked up in the building itself and now they're in their cell with their feet in stocks so they're not going anywhere now, I did take a picture, or excuse me, I didn't take the picture. I got the picture off the internet, and it's a drawing, and let's bring that up here a minute. This is a picture of uh, of a guy, and this comes from probably the, the 1800s or something, or in the days of the pilgrims. But here's a guy with his hands in the stock, and that's the idea of the stock there, as you can see my mouse cursor going over it. Apparently... Uh, and I think movies have depicted this where they're sitting down they're leaning against the wall and then their feet are sticking out and they're not in a in stocks like in the bottom there but they're basically in this sort of apparatus that their hands are going through except it's on their on their feet so they're sitting down and they got that across their legs and they're sitting there locked up and they got probably chains on them as well so they're they're fairly secure they're not able to uh, you know roam around so much so let's uh, let's get rid of that I'm hitting the wrong window there we go okay so he put him in the most secure part and what happened was at midnight it says Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God now the prisoners, it says, were listening to him through the walls or through the corridors. They could hear him singing, singing uh, hymns to the Lord. They were no doubt sounding joyous. Now, this was a, quite a different witness. You could imagine if somebody was crying out to God in a situation like that, maybe the prisoners would have heard him say, Oh, Lord, help me. How dare they beat me up like this? Oh, Lord, get them back. You know, please, Lord, do something. I don't know that it was that sort of deal. I think they were just rejoicing. The early church had a habit of, of rejoicing to count it the fact that they were worthy to suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus. And I don't think that they were very um, complaining to God. I think they were just thanking God. It could have been worse for them, but they were praising God. They were filled with the joy of the Lord. And... The prisoners were listening to this, and they must have thought, wow, these Christians are really oddballs that they're rejoicing at a time like this. Well, what happened was, I don't know if God's plan was originally, you know, so to speak, to just provide this earthquake, or the fact that they brought on the response of God in an earthquake by praising God in a situation like that. It's kind of like going back to Acts, I think, chapter 4 there, where they were all in one accord praying together, remember? And that powerful prayer, it says the building shook. And so God was recognizing their prayer. 
in the fact that maybe they were unified or what they were praying about, but they had extreme favor with the Lord at that time in the early church and the, and the building shook. I, I don't know about you. I've never been to a prayer meeting where the, the building is shaken. We're, we're just hoping the Lord is going to, you know, hear our prayers and answer them. Now, here's what they were doing. They were praising the Lord, possibly praying. Well, then it says there was a great earthquake. And I don't know how common earthquakes are in that part of the world, but it doesn't mention too many earthquakes in the New Testament. It does mention there's one at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, and that says an earthquake broke open the tombs. And of course, there's talking about many of earthquake in the book of Revelation, but I can't think of any others off the top of my head there. Well, anyway, an earthquake happens, and uh, what happens here is that uh, not only does the, the foundations of the prison were shaken, the doors were opened, and the chains were loosed. Now, you would expect in an earthquake that the foundations and the bricks and the mortar and all that would have been, you know, affected. It would, could have felt fallen in, caved in. It didn't kill anybody, but... The doors were opened. You could see that even happening. But what would an earthquake have to do with the chains being, you know? I think that was an added touch by the Lord there. But their chains were loosed. Now the keeper of the prison, it says he awoken from sleep. And he saw the prison doors open. And he thought, oh no. Well, at that point, he assumed everybody had escaped. I mean, I would have too. In a normal situation, everybody would have said, hey, let's get out of here. This is our chance. And they would have taken off. And they would have been thinking, this is awesome. But they stuck around. In fact, here, here's what happens. It says, he woken from sleep, and he has supposed that everybody fled. So he was going to draw the sword to kill himself. Okay. Why would he do that? Well, we know through the scriptures and the way the Roman Empire was set up, if you were in charge of prisoners and they escaped, it could cost you your life. And we notice in uh, Acts 12, that's what happened to the soldiers that were guarding Peter. When an angel came and let Peter out, um, they also, uh, what Herod it said that killed them. You know, after examining the, the guards, he killed them, had them put to death. They could, what could they say? They didn't know what happened. They didn't let him out, but they were responsible. They were in charge. And this guy, even though it was no fault of his own, he was going to think to himself, well, they're going to have my head on a platter anyway. I might as well just kill myself now. And then, and then he wouldn't even have to face the, the, uh, the stigma of, of being someone who let the prisoners out or something or uh, the scrutiny of the, the trial that would, you know, if he had a trial, they would just probably say, you're dead, you're dead, man. And he didn't want to go through all that. So he was going to kill himself. But what happens is, is, uh, but Paul, he calls with a loud voice, and he says, Do yourself no harm. We're all here. We haven't escaped. Well, right there, you got two things going on. The prisoners didn't leave, I think, when they could have, because it was such a witness to them, they understood that it was the Lord that did this. And they knew that Paul and Silas were had to have something to do with this by their praising and praying to God that God did this in response to that. And they were either in the fear of God or they wanted to stick around and wanted to know more about what was going on. They, they had no intention of leaving. That, that was a miracle there. And then the fact that, um, that, the, uh, that the jailer you know, thought they're all there you know, that, that was unbelievable to him, I'm sure. So it says he called for light, and what did he do? He ran in and trembling, it says, before Paul and Silas, and he brought him out of there. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, all of these events, you know, the witness of the men not leaving was a great witness to that jailer as well. And all of these events probably realizing from the start that they were arrested by uh, nothing they really did wrong other than, their, other than their faith. And then he sees that there's a miraculous thing taking place. He is now convinced 
that they have the answer, right? He was under conviction maybe of his own sin, but he knew they had the way of salvation. Maybe there was other stuff going on before that. Maybe that they were sharing the faith and he heard that or he knew some of the gospel. We don't know. But we do know that he was moved by all of this and he went and asked him, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And of course, this great verse, verse 31. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And of course, this is a great verse for evangelism, a great verse of salvation, because it is a matter of our belief in Christ. It's not of any good works that we do. I think, and this is a bit of a controversy, a lot of people think that if you believe on Christ, then that means your household will be saved too. Kind of like by proxy or basically writing on your coattails. So if you believe on Christ, then that's some sort of guarantee that your household will be saved um, automatically. I don't believe that. I think it contradicts too many other passages um, when it pertains to personal salvation and a relationship with the Lord. I think what is meant here is that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. In other words, if your household believes on Christ, they'll be saved as well. And so that was uh, the, the word there. Now, if you haven't done that, my friends, if you've never believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are wandering around wondering what's going to happen to you when you die, if you are one who maybe is trusting in the fact that you've done more good on this earth than you've done bad, or somehow God will see that you mean well, you haven't killed anybody, and therefore by those standards you should be able to get to heaven. But my friend, the Bible teaches there's none who do good, not even one. There's none righteous, not even one. And that is why Christ had to come down to this earth, is that he came down, God became a man, so that he could live a righteous life. And he did it on our behalf. And then he went to the cross, he died on the cross, crucified, died, was buried on the third day, rose again from the dead. And he calls all of us now to repent and to believe in him. And so that is the simple gospel. It's not of works. It's a matter of believing on Christ. A genuine saving faith too, not a mere intellectual sense, not just thinking these things, but acting on them in faith. All right, back to our text. The jailer, uh, then it says, uh, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. So I'm sure they re, uh, re, redid the gospel to them, uh, to, the, to the jailer. They uh, went over it again with him and then also to his family. And then, they, of course, because of that, they believed. They took them the same hour at night. They washed their stripes, uh, the least they could do, I guess as they were thankful they didn't run off and they were thankful they got saved. It says immediately he and all his family were baptized. I believe that's because they were all saved because they all believed. And then when he brought them into his house, he set food before them and rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household believed too. And so that my friend, we don't know how many kids he had or you know his wife and children. A lot of people will say this is why uh, we are to baptize children. Um, I don't know that that supports that. Um, I don't particularly take that view uh, that children are to be baptized. I believe in more of a baby dedication, like is talked about in, uh, you know, Samuel was dedicated by the, to the Lord by Hannah. So if we want to have a little ceremony in the church where we dedicate a, a young child or a baby, and all that means is that we're not deeming him saved or, or her saved at that point. We're saying we want to dedicate their life to the Lord and we'll, as a congregation, do everything in our power as we know the family to support them in raising that kid in the things and the ways of the Lord. And so we set him apart in that sense. It has nothing to do with uh, someone's uh, salvation at that point. All right, so anyway, they, they believed and uh, they were baptized and then they, as a being thankful, they, they brought food 
It doesn't say what happened to the other prisoners at that point. We know they didn't take off. Perhaps they got some of that food or something. They were treated well, I'm sure, after that. And uh, so if we go to our, our next section, uh, I'll read that. Um, let's see here. If uh, Zoom in a little bit. Okay. Um, let's see what happened here. Okay. The wrong page. Bear with me. All right. In verse 35, And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers, saying, Let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these things uh, to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart, go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they want us to put out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come out themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So what you have here is that, first of all, the jailer is all excited because he's saying, whatever took place, these magistrates decided to, to let you go. Being beaten and put in jail overnight was enough punishment, apparently, for what you did. Maybe they had a change of mind or the, they thought let's just you know it wasn't that big a deal they got their beating now let's just get get them out of there and so that's what the report was that the jailer he was all excited on their behalf but Paul saying no wait a minute you know they beat us uh, openly and they want us to go out secretly and so kind of like they were in the wrong they realized they were in the wrong once they realized they were Romans, it was unlawful to beat a Roman or to condemn a Roman without a fair trial. And these guys are Roman citizens. And so they were like sort of in hot water. They didn't want this to become known. They could have gotten a lot of trouble from the higher ups in the Roman Empire. So what they wanted to do is just sort of whisk them out of town unnoticed. There was a commentator that did say that he also... Paul was not just thinking of himself. He wasn't just thinking of, hey, I just want to uh, prove my point to them. I want to I want to make them be humble and come and let us out and, and basically, you know, treat them um, like I'm going to make them come and grovel and get us out of here because they know they were wrong. Well, they think that there was more to it than that. that and somehow he was protecting those that were believers in that town so that they wouldn't in turn get any retaliation in other words if paul and them would have just left without the official uh, send-off by the town they didn't want the the new believers that were forming the church that would form that church in lydia's house they didn't want them to be under any kind of persecution or scrutiny uh, because of what paul and silas did and so they they assured this by making the officials come and do this. That's an interesting uh, insight. But whatever the case, uh, they did come and they basically, um, you know, says, could you just leave? Let's call it a day. I think Paul, of course, on several occasions, he uses Roman citizenship to his advantage. And so we know there's nothing wrong with that. If we can use the laws of the land to our advantage, now, I would say this as a practical instruction. There's a time and a place to leave a city. Now, in most of the cities that Paul and them preached, and they were persecuted, they were ran out of town. And so they had no choice but to sort of escape by the skin of their teeth, and they go to the next town. Uh, one time they dusted the dust of the, of the city off of their feet and because they, they rejected the word. And they said, okay, we're leaving. You rejected Christ. We're, we're going to move on. So they did that sort of a thing to leave town. In this case, now they could have dug in their heels, couldn't they have? Couldn't they have said, well, hey, we're Romans and, you know, um, you shouldn't have beat us, but we're not going to leave town. You know, we're going to stay here as long as we want. Well, there are times to move on. There's times to stay back. 
And because they were traveling preachers, they probably discerned from the Lord that, no, this was a time to move on. And so what they did is they uh, decided they weren't going to dig in their heels. And, and sometimes that's the thing to do. I'm going to give you a, a, a testimony of what happened to me, and I'll try to make it brief because it is quite a long story. But basically, I was doing street ministry. I ran across this day center. Basically, it was a day center for people that were mentally handicapped. And you had people that were mildly depressed to people that probably should have been locked up to, and everything in between. And they would come. It was called Compass Health. It was located in Everett, Washington, my hometown. And so I would frequent that place and I would just uh, initially I'd visit with people and I'd carry my Bible and next thing you know, I'm witnessing to them and over a period of several months and I'd go down there a couple days a week, not always on the same day. I was doing jail ministry at the time and so what I would do is I would in between the jail sessions, I'd walk down there and I would, I found that place so I started doing ministry there. And I started, uh, I was invited in one time to do a Bible study by one of the residents well, I decided I probably should do out of it outside, you know, just to keep a low profile. Didn't want the the secular organization to, you know, start getting the guy, people in trouble and this and that. So at one time, I had about 25 of them gathered around me outside. I kid you not. And all I was doing was reading the word to them. I wasn't even commenting on it. They were so hungry and they were so captivated by the word. You could have heard a pin drop. With that many people, with that many problems to keep silent, that was a real miracle of God. I was never forget it. I was outside reading them a word. I was sitting against a cyclone fence and they were gathered around me in a semicircle. Some were sitting, some were standing. It drew quite a bit of attention from a distance because people probably thought, what's that? What are they doing over there? Well, I think the, the, the management kind of came out and saw what was going on, realized that everybody that's supposed to be in their day center is outside there with this guy. What's going on? Well, finally, the, the director guy, he came up to me and says, you know, you're outside here. You're not technically, you know, on our property. I don't have the authority to tell you to leave. I'm not going to call the police and hassle you but you are disrupting our group here and, and so on and so forth. So would you please consider not coming here anymore? And I thought, man, I'm in a real, I'm in a real bind here. Cause I, I, I thought you're right. You don't have the authority to kick me out. Um, so I says, well, let me, let me put it to prayer. Let me think about this. I don't want to give you my answer. So I prayed about it for about a week and I decided that the Lord was moving me on. Now, had I got direction from the Lord to stay there, I certainly would have. I wasn't afraid of, of staying and digging in my heels. I just think I was there long enough. I was there for a season. What my accomplishment was, was there was done, and it was time to move on. And so I told the guy that I would I would move on. And and I did see some of those other people and you know other parts of the town after that. But there is a good example of where you could either stay or go. And you really need direction from the Lord. So that's what Paul and Silas did. They decided to take off. And in verse 16 uh, through 39, or excuse me, chapter 16, 39, 40, wrapping it up, it says, Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. And so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So they had already begun a small group, apparently meeting at Lydia's house to do a church, if you will, to gather as believers, uh, praying together, reading the Bible together, uh, the Old Testament, that's all they had, reading any uh, letter Paul had written that eventually he wrote to the church in Philippi. There's a book called the Philippians. There's other people, by the time the church formed, there was other people in the church we, I saw a movie once based on this passage, and it, it, it even showed that slave girl in the midst of these believers when they went to leave town. They saw the, they had her sitting there. Now, in the text, it doesn't say that, that she was, you know, joined them in that manner, but I'd like to think that she got saved. They, she wasn't delivered in vain. But she was, in fact, freed from that demon. She believed on the Lord, and she would have joined the group of believers there. 
uh, but it doesn't say exactly. But they did probably encourage them. It says there in the text they uh, stayed there a short time and then they departed and they moved on. And so next week we're going to see where they moved on to the city of Thessalonica, if I can pronounce that right, the city of the Thessalonians. And um, But that's all we have for uh, this time, my friends. So I hope you enjoyed our time together in the book of Acts. And until we meet again, uh, God bless you.